Hello and welcome to my Dragonflight Windwalker Monk PvP guide. I'll be covering everything you need to know to do well as a monk in PvP, as well as some little extra details that you may or may not have known about. I'm going to start out by covering each fundamental part of monk separately, going over the damaging toolkit, defensives, utility, mobility, and so on. I'll leave timestamps in the timeline and in the description so that you can navigate it easily. So I'm going to start out with a damaging toolkit for Windwalker. I'm going to go through each ability one by one and talk about the talents that affect those abilities so it all kind of makes sense as I go through. Windwalkers have two main resources, energy and chi. Energy is used to fuel your healing spells and your utility, but it's mainly used to be spent on Tiger Palm. Tiger Palm costs 50 energy, deals a small amount of damage, and has an 8% chance to make your next blackout kick cost no chi, and it generates two chi by default. The reason it says it generates three on the tooltip is because of a talent called Power Strikes, which makes it so that every 15 seconds, your next Tiger Palm has a chance to generate one additional chi and deal double damage. Now, even though Tiger Palm is only a generator, there are a lot of buffs and things that it grants you that are really important to, you know, your burst damage and to your sustain damage. And if you want to get as much out of your monk as you can, you need to pay attention to Tiger Palm. The first one of those things is Sky Reach. This is definitely the most important. It grants your Tiger Palm a 10 yard dash when used, like so. And when you use it, it applies a crit chance buff for you and it increases the chance for that target to be critically struck by 30% for six seconds. On the tooltip, it says 50%, but it's 30 in PVP because it's been nerfed. And that can only occur once per minute. As you can see on the target, there's a debuff on him that says he's unable to benefit from Sky Reach for another 26 seconds. This is something that you need to monitor, and every time you use Tiger Palm on someone, you need to be sure that you're getting value out of this because crits are 75% extra damage, and it's a big part in you dealing good damage. On top of that, there is Alpha Tiger, which grants you 20% haste when Tiger Palming. So every time you engage a new enemy, whether it be in a battleground, open world, whatever, you will get effectively 30% crit chance and 20% extra haste. Now, because Alpha Tiger gives you 20% haste, but not just on that target, you can use that, you know, on pets and things and totems uh, that you're not going to deal any sort of good damage to or you don't need to attack just solely for the purpose of keeping that haste buff up so if you're fighting against an unholy dk a bm hunter you just keep on using tiger palm on those pets to generate the alpha tigers and that way you've just got 20 percent haste more frequently and more haste means better energy regen and cooldown reduction on your spenders the last thing that affects tiger palm is teachings of the monastery and this actually ties into the next ability i'm going to cover blackout kick Every time you Tiger Palm, it gives you a stack of this buff, which makes your next Blackout Kick hit an additional time stacking up to 3, and then each Blackout Kick you throw out has a chance to reset the cooldown of the next ability I'm going to cover, Rising Sun Kick. So every Tiger Palm gives you this buff, lasts for 20 seconds, and you press Blackout Kick, throws out an extra Blackout Kick depending on how many stacks you have. Now Blackout Kick is a filler ability costs one chi and each time you use it it reduces the cooldown on sun kick and fist of fury when used i'll cover those in a second but there are some things to mention about blackout kick now even though blackout kick is only a filler ability it does a substantial amount of damage thanks to teachings of the monastery so every tiger palm you do it gives you a stack of that and then when you blackout kick it does a bunch of extra hits now you can see it's cleaving there that's thanks to another talent called shadow boxing treads so it hits two extra targets. So every blackout kick, including the extra blackout kicks from Teachings of the Monastery, will cleave. The cool thing about this cleave is that it doesn't count as AoE damage, meaning it does full damage to pets. And so you'll be naturally cleaving pets with solid damage. So you can potentially swap to them, kill pets, and you know, that can be very helpful against certain comps, especially against hunters. Now, the next ability we have is Rising Sun Kick. So this is your main single target damaging ability. It does a bulk amount of damage and it reduces the healing they take by 25% for 10 seconds. This is something that you want to be trying to keep up as much as possible. And Black Eye Kick reduces its cooldown, but also through Teachings of the Monastery, you have a chance to outright reset the cooldown. And this is something that you want to be paying attention to when you're doing your rotation. And Sun Kick is on cooldown, when you're blackout kicking, sometimes you'll see a complete reset of its cooldown, like that, and you can Sun Kick again. And paying attention to that is pretty important. A talent that modifies Sunkick is Glory of the Dawn. 
this just has a 25% chance to grant you one chi and do a small amount of extra damage. Basically, it just has a chance to refund one chi that it's spent. Nothing too major, but it is something. Now, the next ability is Fist of Fury. Now, Fist of Fury is an AoE ability. It channels over the course of four seconds, dealing a really good amount of damage. The channel time is reduced by haste, so Alpha Tiger, as I mentioned before, um, and also other talents, Invoker's Delight, for instance, can reduce its channel time by a lot. And both Sun Kick and Fist of Fury have their cooldowns reduced based on how much haste you have. Now, there's a lot to do with Fist of Fury, a lot of damage modifiers with this. The main one, I would say, is Transfer the Power. This makes it so that every Black Hat Kick and Sun Kick increase the damage dealt by Fist of Fury by 3%, stacking 10 times. That counts for each Black Hat Kick that you throw out with Teachings in the Monastery. So, if I Tiger Palm twice and then a Black Hat Kick, I get three stacks to Transfer the Power. Sun Kick also generates stacks. So, as you're doing your rotation, essentially every Black Hat Kick is going to generate at least one, but most of the time two or more and then once you've got a bunch of stacks to transfer the power you use them fist of fury deals a bunch of damage and then after fist of fury you get zuen's battle gear so sun kick crits reduce the cooldown of fist of fury but then fist of fury increases the crit chance of sun kick by 40 percent after channeling fist of fury you also get your tier set bonus which grants your next sun kicks two if you have two set or three if you have the four set a 30 percent damage buff and then after using those enhanced sun kicks or crane kicks, your next Fist of Fury hits harder. So you can potentially have a 15% modifier on Fist of Fury from the four set. You can have 30% from Transfer the Power. And then your sun kicks are hitting harder and your Fist of Furies are hitting harder and it all kind of comes together like that. You also have open palm strikes. This makes it so that Fist of Fury has a chance to refund chi. Again, it's something small, but sometimes you get extra chi, you can dump it on another blackout kick. It can be helpful and something to sort of keep in mind. Now, these four abilities are pretty much the bread and butter of Windwalker. When you're not bursting, when you're kind of just doing sustained damage, it is these four abilities that make up the fundamentals of what Monk is. And it's all of these little modifiers like Twins Battle Gear, Sky Reach, and all that that kind of work in conjunction with that to give you what the class feels like. But there is some other stuff that needs to be mentioned. So, Spinning Crane Kick. You pretty much will not use this button unless you have a Dance of Chi-Chi proc. This increases the damage of Spinning Crane Kick by 150% in PvP, unless I'm mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it's still nerfed. And Spinning Crane Kick also deals more damage when you have Mark of the Crane active. So for each target you've struck with Tiger Palm, Black Air Kick, or Sun Kick, you will get a stack of this, up to five stacks or a 90% damage increase. A Spinning Crane Kick can do some very good damage, 90% modifier from there, 150% modifier from Dance of chi and then 30% modifier from the set bonus. So there's a lot that can play into Dance of chi and Spinning Crane Kicks. But aside from that, you pretty much aren't going to press this. It costs 2 Chi, it's not doing good damage by itself, but with procs, it will do a lot of damage, even now. If you played Monk in Shadowlands, it's... Not that crazy with like bone dust and the spinning, but it's still pretty good. Next up, we've got our big hitter, Strike of the Windlord. This does a very large amount of damage on a 40 second cooldown, does not get reduced by haste, and it hits everything in a cone in front of you, but it deals reduced damage to secondary targets. However, for each target that you hit, it grants you a stack of Thunder Fist, and Thunder Fist will do damage to the target that you are currently auto attacking. So you always want to try and hit as many people as you can with Windlord when practical. If you don't have to go out of your way or do something sketchy to do it, it's, you know, do it when you can. But regardless, Windlord with Thunderfist, even on one target, is still very good damage. And this is going to sort of be the, the forefront of your burst. It's kind of the opener. And you kind of want to be careful with how you use this. You don't want to throw it out, you know, just randomly. It's something that can force cooldowns. It's pretty good by itself. So you want to be careful with how you use Strike the Windlord. We also have Feline Stomp. So this deals a really small amount of damage, pretty much as much as a Blackout Kick, but it gives the target a debuff that makes them take 8% more damage from you. And also anything that gets healed will take 8% increased healing. And that also applies to you. So if you want to heal yourself and it's like an emergency, you can use this while you're on the move. And then you take 8% increased healing from yourself, which can be handy. As a general rule, when you've got some good damage lined up, when you have like stacks that transfer the power, 
you've got like your set bonus rolling and what have you you usually go like for a phalanx stomp first and then go into like the tiger palm get your sky reach rolling get your alpha tiger rolling then go in for like a strike of the wind lord fist of fury sun kick and like that alone will do a lot of damage and force cooldowns assuming you have all those procs and things rolling and you want to phalanx stomp before you do any of that because of the extra damage and phalanx stomp is kind of just its own thing it doesn't really play a huge part in the rotation but you just use it before you have good damage now it does have a chance to reset when using other abilities when standing in the phalanx stomp area so if i'm using spells and abilities while standing in it i might just get a reset there you go and then you can use it again now depending on the situation you may or may not get resets. Sometimes you'll use Phalanx Stomp and then the fight will shift somewhere completely different and you won't get another reset because you have to stand inside of it. The area of which you have to be standing in is pretty lenient. I'm pretty sure you can still be standing like out here and still get resets. You don't have to be directly on it, but it is something to keep in mind. But I wouldn't stress too heavily on getting resets of Phalanx Stomp. Just make sure you're using it before you're dealing good damage. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about the cooldowns, the damage cooldowns. So we've got Serenity or Storm Within Fire. So Serenity gives you 12 seconds of 15% increased damage and anything that costs Chi, the cooldown of that is halved effectively and those things cost no Chi anymore. Now the way the cooldown reduction works, if you kind of want to think about it, the main thing it's going to be affecting is Strike of the Windlord because it has a 40 second cooldown and it's not affected by anything else. So when 12 seconds pass during Serenity, 24 seconds will have been shaved off of Strike of the Windlord. So by the end of Serenity, if you like Serenity Windlord straight away, it will be on a 16 second cooldown and you can use it again pretty soon. That's one of the reasons why Serenity is good because after Serenity runs out, you got Strike of the Windlord again, you can swap to a different target with your Sky Reach, your Alpha Tiger and everything, and then do like another burst. And obviously it's reducing the cooldown of your Fist of Fury and everything, and you don't have to use Tiger Palms in between. So there's no globals spent on generators when you want to be using your big hitters. So Serenity dials up the damage to 15 for 12 seconds, pretty much. Your other cooldown option is Storm Earth and Fire. And you press this and it splits you into three and it each spirit deals 42% of normal damage. So it has been nerfed. It used to be 45%, but now it's 42. You have two charges to this. It's the same cooldown. Uh, and depending on which one you want to play, it's you don't want to run Stormworth and Fire against anything that has lots of AoE crowd control because you will get countered. Anything like a Boomkin, like Mass Entangle, like any Druid that has Mass Entangle, a Shaman with Earth Grab Totem, Mages with Frost Nova and Ice Nova, Evokers with Landslide. There's so many things that can counter it. But I will say that I think you will find sustain damage to be pretty high and your burst output consistent with Storm Earth and Fire. But Serenity is the reliable option. So you kind of choose between either of these. But if you kind of want just like the easy choice it works and pick serenity and just forget about storm earth and fire um because storm earth and fire kind of needs macros and things to work properly it's gimmicky i will talk about the macros and stuff in a later section but these are your two choices of offensive cooldowns either serenity or storm earth and fire the other cooldown you have is invokes when so this summons a tiger it deals passive damage every second like a sort of aoe nature lightning thing and then it also just does auto attacks Zoen also benefits from this talent and powered Tiger Lightning. So while Zoen is out, 10% of the damage you deal is dealt every 4 seconds in bursts from Zoen. So if you do 100k damage in 4 seconds, Zoen will deal 10k damage and then it will reset and then it will happen again. So if in those next 4 seconds you do 120k, then Zoen will do 12k. So it's basically just a 10% damage buff while Zoen is active. Now that damage buff can also proc off of Fury of Zoen. Now, Fury of Zawen is basically a talent, and every time you use an ability that is not a repeat of the previous, so your mastery, so if you are, if you do Tiger Palm, Black Hair Kick, Tiger Palm, Sun Kick, Tiger Palm, Fist of Fury, each of those abilities will generate a stack as long as you're not repeating. And when you Fist of Fury, you have a chance, based on how many stacks you have, to summon Zawen for 8 seconds. And that Zawen that you summon from this proc 
will grant you Empower Tiger Lightning. So you can proc Sawen and get 10% increased damage for 8 seconds, pretty much, plus the damage that he will do, and 5% haste. Summoning Zawin also grants you Invoker's Delight, which is 33% haste for 20 seconds after summoning. That haste increase will reduce the cooldown of your Fist of Fury and make your channel faster, more frequent sun kicks, faster auto attacks, more energy. So Zawin is definitely a very powerful cooldown, despite the fact that it doesn't grant you an obvious damage increase like Serenity would, it is still very, very strong. And by obvious damage increase, I mean it doesn't take your sun kick from doing 100k to 130k. It's It gives you damage in other ways. Monks also have Touch of Death, which is a execute. If a player is under 15% health and you press Touch of Death on them, unless they have an incredibly strong absorb shield, like a life cocoon, or like a crit rapture shield or something, Touch of Death will pretty much kill them instantly. So Touch of Death is great for that. It only works, however, if you have this talent taken, which you probably should. For PvP, it's crazy. But yeah, you should absolutely spec into this. So now with the damage toolkit wrapped up, I want to talk about the utility. So as a monk, you've got a stun, you've got an end cap, you've got a knockback, and a slow. Leg sweep is a 5 second duration minute cooldown stun, and this gets modified by Tiger Tail Sweep as a talent, which increases its range by 2 yards, even if you only put 1 point into it. Putting another point into it reduces its cooldown by another 5 seconds. Now, I mentioned this in my previous guide, but you basically always want to jump before leg sweeps because it just gives you increased range. The range on it is pretty gnarly. It's slightly less than ma uh, max castable Fist of Fury range. So if I, I think if I jump here, yeah, it hits from there, which is pretty nuts. And you also have to keep in mind that if there was another target standing equal distance from this target dummy over here, it would hit them too. So that, that's the sort of range you're looking at. Like, it's pretty crazy. Pretty much, I think if Crane Kick would hit it, then Leg Sweep with a jump would also hit it. So keep in mind, always jump before Leg Sweeps. Next up is Ring of Peace. Pretty simple, it's just a knockback. You put it down, anything that stands in it will get knocked out from the center. You can use it to knock people off of ledges. You can use it to deny certain areas in an arena. You can use it to stop or interrupt casts like Polymorph or a Chaos Board or something. It's got a lot of purposes and it's just very good. There are some classes that can pretty easily deal with it though. For instance, a warrior can Bladestorm through it. Death Knights can use Death's Advance to just walk through it. Weirdly enough, it diminishes with Ursoul's Vortex from Druids. But it only diminishes if the Ursoul's Vortex comes first. But it pretty much doesn't diminish with anything else. It doesn't diminish with Blast Wave, it doesn't diminish with like Typhoon, but it diminishes with Ursol's Vortex. So that's something to keep in mind. If you ever play with a Druid that drops Ursol's Vortex, Ring of Peace won't work. But if you Ring of Peace first, Ursol's Vortex will still work. Next, we have Paralysis. This is an Incapacitate effect. It's got a 30 second cooldown, 20 yard range, and it lasts for four seconds. Similar to Ring of Peace, you can use it to interrupt cast and such, but you can also use it to just, you know, deny burst. You know, if uh, a rogue is bursting your healer, for example, you can use Paralysis to stop that burst. Maybe get their trinket. You can use it to set up kills. So if you're going to use it on your kill target, that way you can leg sweep them safely. Or you can use it on an off target, and then that can be followed up by your partner, and then you leg sweep kill target. Just like a, a general strategy thing. But Paralysis has a lot of uses. And lastly, you have Disable, which is a 50% slow and the duration of the slow gets refreshed by your melee attacks. So if I slow something and I just attack it, that will never run out as long as I'm hitting it. And if I use disable again on a slowed target, it doesn't actually have to be disable. It will root them in place for three seconds and then one and a half seconds and then 0.75 seconds in PvP. And also as a monk, you have an interrupt. It's a four second duration kick on a 15 second cooldown. Now, PvP talent options for utility, you've got Grapple Weapon, which is a disarm, it's a ranged disarm, which is great, 45 second cooldown, and Mighty Ox Kick, which when you press it, it lobs targets sort of in an arc over you. So if I use it on this thing, it will lob the target sort of like this over my head and behind me. I can't do it on this thing because uh, it's locked in place, but that's basically what it does. You can use this to put people out of position, Z-axis maps like Blade's Edge, similar to Ring of Peace, like pretty much the exact same uh, purposes but just as a pvp talent and an extra knockback and 
they don't DR with each other. So you can Ring of Peace and then Ox Kick and they can both be used whenever you want. And they don't DR with anything aside from Earth Souls with uh, Ring of Peace. And that pretty much wraps up utility. So now I'm going to talk about defense. First up is Fortifying Brew. This is a talent that gives you 15% extra HP and 20% damage reduction. It's modified by this to either have a two minute cooldown reduction, so from six minutes to four minutes, or a 25% increase in armor and dodge chance. Now, you always be safe with this choice because shaving two minutes off a of four brew might save your life, but into something where dodging can be important, in a similar situation, you know, where you would take grapple weapon against an arms warrior or a mark hunter, having that dodge chance can be really nice especially if you were to dodge like the first hit of rapid fire and it just cancels out completely, it can be really strong. I will say though that the armor that you get from this is not additive, it's multiplicative. So you get 25% multiplied on your armor rather than just 25% extra physical damage reduction. So you get like 4% or something. So it's nothing crazy, but the dodge chance is good. So in a short game where the game will be over, easily before four minutes and there's things to dodge then you can take this but in every other situation you take the cooldown reduction next up is touch of karma this gives you a shield for 50 percent of your max hp for 10 seconds and 70 percent of the damage you take while it's active gets redirected to the target you put touch of karma on so if i press it that target will now take 70 percent of the damage i take as a dot and it keeps on refreshing with a six second duration Touch of Karma can be removed with physical damage immunities, so it can be removed with Blessing of Protection, Divine Shield, and Ice Block. 50% of your health is not a lot when you think about it. No one really cares about Touch of Karma, and this defensive by itself is not safe. Generally, it's like you use Karma and you do something else. Like you Karma, but you're ready to run away, or you Karma if you need to go offensive into sort of like a bad position, like if it's if you're playing risky, you know. Karma by itself pretty much will never save you in serious damage situations. You can pre-karma a kidney shot against Rogue Mage and easily still die. So it's kind of weak, but you know, don't hold on to karma forever thinking it's gonna save you. Pretty much is what I'm saying. Something to mention about touch of karma though is because the shield is based on your max HP. You can four brew beforehand to make the karma shield bigger. You can also use a gladiator's emblem trinket, and that will give you a bulk amount of HP, like 100,000 extra or something. So that will add 50% of that health that you got from whatever health modifier you're using onto touch of karma. So if you really need to like be defensive, make sure you use like health modifier, then touch of karma. Your other two defensives are Diffuse Magic, this is a magic damage reduction, and any magical effects that are on you will be redirected to the caster, if possible. So if a Warlock puts Soul Rot, Unstable Affliction, Corruption on you, you can redirect all of that. You will take the Dispel damage from UA though, but all of that damage will be redirected onto the Warlock and deal its full damage. So you can reverse the pressure on a Warlock potentially by doing that. And then you've also got Dampen Harm. This reduces your damage taken by 20 to 50% based on how much damage the attack does. I don't exactly know the threshold on this though. I don't know how much damage something needs to do to get the 50% damage reduction on that, but this is basically an all-purpose damage reduction where this is purely for magical damage. So those are your four defensive abilities, but as a monk, you need to know how to run away because running and not making yourself an easy target is kind of your best defensive. So on the topic of mobility, that's what we're gonna be talking about now. First off, you've got roll. You have three charges of it on a 15 second cooldown. And this can cover a pretty big distance by itself. And it's gonna be your main gap closer. You've also got flying serpent kick, which travels a large distance by itself. This is a 20 second cooldown. You've got tiger's lust. This is great. It's a 70% movement speed increase. It stacks with other speed increases such as enchants and whatnot and it removes root and snare effects so if you get stuck in a frost nova you can remove it from yourself if your healer gets stuck in a root beam from a druid you can remove it from them and your longest cooldown mobility is transcendence and when you press transcendence you drop a spirit down and then when you use transcendence transfer 
you swap places with it. And thanks to a talent called Escape from Reality, if you transcendence again within 10 seconds, you can swap back to the place that you originated from. Another cool thing that you can do thanks to Escape from Reality is let's say that you have your port up on top of a bridge or something and there's a class who can cover that distance you know like a warrior can heroic leap up there or maybe a monk's chasing you and you leave your port up there but then he leaves his port and you know that he's going to teleport back up what you can do is this you can leave your port up here and then you can jump down and you can port up and then he'll port up again but then what you can do is you can leave your port and then jump down and then pull up again. And as long as your teleport had been there for 10 seconds so that the cooldown on transcendence has reset, you can port back to the same place twice. So you can essentially double bait people off ledges and stuff. And finally, now that we have mobility covered, I'm gonna talk about healing. So you have two main heals as a Windwalker, either Vivify, with the cost 30 energy and just heals you for a little bit, and Expel Harm. Now Vivify by itself doesn't heal for a lot. However, you can do some things to make it heal for quite a bit more. Improved Vivify can be used to increase it by up to 40%, and Vivacious Vivification can make it instant cast every 10 seconds, so while you're on the move, you can just have instant cast Vivifies, which can be great for solo play and stuff. And then Expel Harm does a decent amount of healing by itself. It can be buffed by 60% with Reverse Harm, and then it's got several talents which buff its healing. Vigorous Expulsion, 5% increased healing and 15% increased crit chance. Strength of Spirit, 100% increased healing based on how much health you're missing. And 50% increased crit healing from Profound Rebuttal. All of these things make Expel Harm potentially healing a lot, especially when you're at low health. The other option you have for healing is Soothing Mist. This heals for a decent amount over the course of 8 seconds, but it's not as energy efficient as Vivify's. And it's also a little bit slower. However, you can do both at the same time. So you can Soothing Mist and cast Vivify while you're channeling that. If you need to heal while also moving around a pillar, it can be pretty good because it cuts down on Vivify cast time. Vivify casts in one and a half seconds. But your global cooldown is one second. Soothing Mist puts you on a one second global cooldown. So what you can do is Soothing Mist and then vivify half a second sooner. So let's say you're running, you're cutting around a pillar, you need to heal yourself, you go soothe, vivify, run, soothe, vivify, run. And you save half a second on casting vivifies. And because you're running in between, most likely you're not going to run out of energy while you're doing that. So that's a good option. And just micromanaging a little bit of extra healing out of your vivifies and using soothing mist to do that can be good. Another option you have is you can fail and stomp before all of this healing. In an emergency where you need to run and you need all the healing you can get, you can drop fail and stomp, provide yourself with fair exposure, and then any healing you do to yourself is buffed by 8%. And finally, you've got Chi Wave. I am not going to mention Chi Burst because that doesn't do a lot of healing, but Chi Wave by itself does about a Vivify worth of healing, assuming you spec into improve Vivify, otherwise it does more. And then this will actually deal a pretty solid amount of healing if you use it with Stormworth and Fire. It's not bad. So you've got two instant heals, potentially a third with Vivacious Vivification, and then pretty fast cast heals if you combine it with Soothing Mist and, you know, the Vivify trick. That can be pretty nice. And also one more thing to mention, Escape from Reality. When you use your Transcendence to port, your Vivifies are cheaper and they heal for more. So in this situation, you can use Soothing Mist and spam vivifies and your healing like this is pretty solid and you can cast it for a while so that combination for healing is pretty nice but that healing is only on yourself it doesn't account for other people it's only on you and with healing covered that's every important spell but there are a couple more spells to mention that are sort of niche the first one is your taunt provoke this is something it's not on the global cooldown, doesn't cost anything, but it triggers combat. So if you need to get in combat and you're like on the move where you need to keep something in combat, you can just press taunt. You can also use it to taunt pets at you. If you want, you know, someone's pet to like continue running at you to stay behind pillar or something, you can use it. You've also got Jade Lightning, which does negligible damage. However, it has a knockback effect. 
The knockback effect is unfortunately a little bit unreliable and kind of weak. Um, but the best way that you can use it is by using paralysis on a target. And assuming they're facing your direction, right? So let's say that towards this rock is a cliff and I've incapped them. If I just cast Jade Lightning at them here, the Jade Lightning damage will break the incapacitate. And then assuming they're a melee, as soon as this incap goes off from the Jade Lightning, auto attack will trigger and knock them back. Because as soon as that incap breaks, they'll just hit me immediately. And the knockback from Jade Lightning only gets procced when I get hit by a melee attack. The other use for it is it can be used to keep your hit combo rolling, proc your mastery and also fury of the wind from range. And you can use it to trigger combat because it's a 40 yard range. So you know, as the gates open, if you need to run out and get combat, you can just tag some with Jade Lightning like that. And there you go. Another thing to mention is as a monk, you have resuscitate. So you can res in arena. Obviously it's rare when you will be able to do that. However, there is a cheeky thing you can do but it's only really practical to do it as a night elf. I've done it a couple of times, but basically what you do is you summon Zawin to get Invoker's Delight. That's a 33% increase in your haste, yeah? After that, you despawn Zawin because you don't want him to keep you in combat. And then you keep your port next to where your partner died. So let's just say that my partner died like over here. I'll keep my port over there. I'll summon Zawin, get the haste buff. Despawn Zwen, Tiger Palm to play Alpha Tiger, Port, Shadow Meld, and my Resuscitate is a 6.1 second cast. Now, if I incap the Tiger before that, he's locked in place for 4 seconds. He only has 2 seconds to get back to me and stop the res. Now, obviously, it's a little bit restrictive because you have to be a Night Elf to do it. But if you're not a Night Elf, it's still kind of possible, but not so much. Because being able to instantly drop combat and go for the res is huge. Other small things to mention, playing a monk, when you hit something it takes 5% extra physical damage. You have Zen Flight, which is just a little cloud thing that you can sit on, which you can use to stop yourself from taking fall damage in areas where flight is enabled. Everything you buy it from price. this vendor in the order hall right here. We will you got Zen Pilgrimage, which you can use to teleport back to this place. And lastly, you've also got Afterlife, so whenever something dies, it heals you for a small amount, but if you kill it with a Blackout Kick, then it gives you a Chi Orb. And that is everything. Now that I've covered every single ability, it's time to get into talent builds. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to show you these two trees. These are the default talents that you can run and use for your twos arenas, for your threes arenas. If you just want to take this and go, that's fine. I'll leave the import link in the description, but I've got some other builds for you, uh, some healing based builds and like little deviations for Stormworth and Fire and Serenity and such. So your options for just the monk tree is pretty much, do you want more damage or do you want more healing? This is the build for threes because you're not gonna be pressing Vivify on threes when you're playing with a healer or even twos with a healer. But let's say that you're jumping into double DPS twos, maybe with a mage you might want some extra healing. So you can drop Ferocity of Zwen and put two points into Improve Vivify, take out either Tiger, put that into the Instant Vivifies. And that's like a pretty easy swap there. You only lose a little bit of damage, but you get a lot more healing. If you want to take it up a notch, you can remove Tiger Tail Sweep and put that into Save Them All, which is emergency healing below 35%. And then if you want to take that a little bit further, you can remove Dampen, and then you can remove Improved Touch of Death and put it into Statue. It, losing Dampen and Improved Touch of Death is a bit of a stretch, I will say. But the healing that you can get from this build is pretty nuts. I'll show you what Statue does and how you can use it. All you do, you just place it down somewhere, and you just channel Soothing Mist for 0.1 of a second and just move away. And this thing will just constantly just channel on you. And you don't have to do anything. And this can be good when you're like running around the pillar, let's say. And you just be like, drop that. Stop for a second and that will heal you while you're running around the pillar. While you're in line, just do that again. And let's say you want to like swap pillars now. Move over somewhere else, drop the statue. And just do that. And it gives you like 
free healing while you're on the move, pretty much. And it's not bad. Like, that 3k tick every second will add up. You will feel it. Especially if you keep that rolling for an entire arena. You'll feel that. This is mainly something you would use in, like, BGs. If you want to just, like, live Lord BGs and never die. But if you want to play practically and not lose a bunch of stuff, then this is, like, the big healing spec. This is healing with utility and, like, the extra range on Tiger Tail. And then the damage spec is that. So those are all your options. Now I will mention, I'm not running Detox. If you need to run Detox, take out Eye of the Tiger and put it into there. You run this against like DK teams and you can remove Unholy Blight and all their diseases and stuff. And it can be good to do that. You can also remove a lot of uh, Assass Rogue poisons and such. The Windwalker Tree is, there's not so much freedom here. Unfortunately, your main choice is going to be, do you want Fury of Zawen or extra Tiger Palm damage? And do you want to run Serenity or Stomach and Fire? So if you want to run Serenity, if you want to run this Serenity build, but you don't like Fury of Zawen, you want extra sustained damage. What you can do is substitute Fury of Zawen, take out a point in there and run this build instead. And that way you put two points into here so you get 30% extra Tiger Palm damage, but you lose out on the Zawen. Personally, I prefer Fury of Zawen, and so I run this build. And by even though this is a pointless talent, it doesn't do anything, you save a point by going this way, which is why you run it. And then that way that point saved can be put into Fury of Zawen. And you can go like that. If you want to play Stormworth and Fire, however, I will mention something about spiritual focus. Drinking Horn Cover doesn't work in arena the reason i'm going this way is for the same reason we go this way because it saves a talent point if you want to run fury of zawen then you have to go this way otherwise you can't so the other way is going spiritual focus which does work in pvp but if you're running serenity i found it's not that good it only reduces its cooldown by 0.3 of a second for every two chi you spend the 12 seconds of free chi that you have during serenity do not count towards spiritual focus so the remaining one minute and 18 seconds where you're spending chi only i've managed to only shave off like eight seconds on a target dummy and that's when you have optimal uptime doing only your damage rotation when you're actually playing arena and you're spending time rolling away running spending time behind a pillar while you get healed up using globals on in-cap and leg sweep and disable and all of this and then you're spending time while cc'd there's a lot of time where you're not doing your dps rotation optimally there are times when you're pulling chi for a burst and you're not using fist and sun kick sometimes for like a couple of seconds so i would say that you're only taking off like four or five seconds of serenity with spiritual focus which just isn't that much spiritual focus with stormworth and fire however is one second shaved off its cooldown per two chi you spend, which is a lot better. If you were shaving off five seconds with Serenity, you'd be shaving off like 16 seconds with Stormworth and Fire. And over the course of a four minute match or something, you might get an extra Stormworth and Fire burst, or you might get that next burst up just in time to do another go with Kiefer's. It can be very noticeable. So if you're gonna play Stormworth and Fire, I would suggest going this route. You don't take Fury as a win because you can't afford it and you go like that. So yeah, those are the two builds. Either Serenity with Fury of Zawen or Double Points in Touch of the Tiger or Stormworth and Fire with Spiritual Focus is my suggestion. You can run Spiritual Focus as Serenity if you like it, but as my personal opinion, I don't think it's worth it. But there is another fun build that you can play, which revolves around touch of death and battlegrounds so what you do is you take out phalanx stomp one point in that and you go down to forbidden technique swen's bond fatal flying guillotine and meridian strikes then over here you take two points out of ferocity of zawen or if you want to take out healing you can take out close to heart put two points into fatal touch and now what you've got is pretty much a minute cooldown touch of death that cleaves five enemies and if you really want to have some fun you can use pressure points. So if you kill a target with touch of death, reduces the cooldown on touch of karma by 60 seconds. So you've got a minute cooldown touch of death 
that turns your karma into a 30 second cooldown. Now, besides that, you've got one other talent build you can run, which I personally am not a fan of. It's the Bone Dust Brew build. The reason I'm not a fan is because it's not very strong at the moment. Even though it has the potential to out damage like the Feline Stomp with the Sun Kick damage buff, because it's still okay, but it's nowhere near as good as it was. In Shadowlands, it was about 50% extra damage. Now it's like 25. It's half as good. So if you want to run that, you take points out of here and you put it into that. And then you can take out a point of Fury of win, put it into attenuation. Keep in mind that this is multiplicative, not additive. So it's going to take it from 40% to 48%. And then minus that 48% by 33% because it's still nerfed in PvP. And that's what you get. So yeah, those are your PvE talent builds. But I want to talk about some PvP talents now. So when it comes to PvP talents, your three default choices are going to be Turbo Fists, Alpha Tiger, and Reverse Harm. Now, Turbo Fists makes it so that your Fist of Fury deals full damage to every target that it hits, slows it by 90%, and you parry all attacks while channeling Fist of Fury, effectively turning your Turbo Fists into a defensive because you'll parry all melee attacks, but also a really good peel because a 90% slow is very strong and is an AoE slow. I already talked about Alpha Tiger during the Tiger Palm section, but basically a 20% haste buff that you can keep up very frequently, especially during a match against pet classes or if there are totems around from a shaman, you can keep it up very frequently. And then Reverse Harm, which increases the healing of your Expel Harm by 60% and makes it generate extra chi. These are going to be the three default choices. The PvP talents worth mentioning are Ride the Wind. This makes it so that your Flying Serpent Kick cleanses snare effects from anyone who stands in the path that it leaves behind. So if I use Flying Serpent Kick right here, it will leave a path behind me, and anyone who walks through this will get 30% increased move speed, and you'll be immune to snares while you stand in it. This can be good against a comp that has really oppressive and consistent slows, maybe something like a Frost Mage, uh, or even a Death Knight with Chains of Ice. They have very good, very frequently applying slows, and Ride the Wind can counter that. Next up is Grapple Weapon. This is a disarm, 30 yard range, lasts for 6 seconds on a 45 second cooldown. Very handy against things like Warriors, Marksmanship Hunters, uh, all Rogue Specs, pretty much anything that relies on their weapon to do damage, Grapple Weapon is very good against them. You have Mighty Ox Kick. This is a knockback that will hurl the target behind you sort of in an arc. So if I were to use it on something like this, it would send the target behind me up and over my head. I'll put a clip up on the screen so you can see the way it sort of operates and how you can use it. Similar uses to Ring of Peace, being able to knock people back, out of position, stop casts, and so forth. Another talent worth mentioning is Wind Waker. This gives you a movement speed increase every time you use a mobility spell, stacking up to 20%. And whenever you use a mobility spell at two stacks, it will cleanse movement impairing effects off of yourself and off of allies within 10 yards. This PvP talent only works if you're specced into Windwalking, so you can take one point out of Ferocity as a win to get it. So basically, if I use a roll, it will give me a stack of Windwalking. If I use another roll, it will give me another stack. If I use Serpent Kick, it will refresh that stack. And the movement speed effect that you get from Windwalking will stack with other effects, like Ride the Wind. And as you can see, I'm essentially sprinting while I'm standing in this. Now, the combination of these two PvP talents can be very good against something like a caster comp like Frost Mage Ellie Shaman or Frost Mage Boomkin or something like that because you're not going to need Turbo Fists because there's nothing to really parry and a comp like that is most likely not going to be stacked up for you to benefit from the Turbo Fists. You're much better off having Snare Cleansers and Snare Immunity and things like that and then if you're playing you know a melee comp like Windwalker DK or something or Windwalker Demon Hunter your Demon Hunter will be getting cleansed from Ride the Wind and from Wind Waker too. But it's very situational. What I've found against something like an Arcane Mage in 2s, for instance, it can be very helpful and more beneficial than running Turbo Fists and Reverse Arm. The other PvP talents aren't too strong, but I'll talk about them anyway. You've got Tiger Eye Brew, which transforms your physical damage abilities into nature damage abilities, effectively going through armor and physical damage immunities like Blessing of Protection. The downside is that you deal 25% less damage when Tiger Eye Brew is active. So unless the target has more than 25% armor, it's going to be a damage loss. So this is only going to be good against something like a tank or a paladin who uses Blessing of Protection or something like that. 
but the damage increase is nowhere near as powerful as it used to be. In Battle for Azeroth, a lot of people had over 25% armor, even leather wearers had more than 25% armor. But at the moment, with the low armor values, for instance, I only have 16%, so I would be losing 9% damage on myself, or someone equally as armored as myself. Disabling Reach gives your Disable a 10 yard range, which can be handy, however, with the addition of Sky Reach, having a 10 yard range Tiger Palm allows you to just dash toward the target. So for chasing, you don't really need Disabling Reach anymore. So its only purpose is really for peeling people. Being able to peel melee attackers without being in range of them can be handy, but I haven't really felt the need for that. And your last talent is Perpetual Paralysis, which makes your Paralysis a 10 yard range, but it spreads to two new enemies when removed. And I've literally never picked this. I assume the way it works is if you're in a battleground and you use it on one person, and that Paralysis broke, it would spread to two new targets, then those Paralysis would break, and spread to two new targets, and sort of spread out. But I don't really see the reason why you would ever need that. You definitely don't need it in Arena, so it's pretty pointless. So to quickly summarize, these three talents, Turbo Fists, Alpha Tiger, and Reverse Harm are your main three, swapping into Grapple Weapon when you need it, and then the Wind Waker slash Ride the Wind build, if you need to go really offensive and need the extra mobility against a caster team. And then you can also take Mighty Ox Kick if you want a little bit of extra crowd control and disruption. So with the PvP talents wrapped up and the normal talents and everything covered, now it's time to talk about your general rotation as a Windwalker. So the rotation for Windwalkers is a little bit different than it has been in the past because you have things to react to, and you've got procs off of things like you know Fist of Fury giving you Zwen's Battle Gear, you've got Feyland Stomp resets, Sun Kick resets off of Blackout Kick. So the rotation is kind of just taking into account all of these little mechanics and weaving them together. So what I'm going to do is just do a demonstration of the rotation and give my thoughts and the things that I'm thinking about as I do it so it makes sense. So if I wanted to walk up to someone and just start hitting them and doing good damage, what I'll do is I'll run in, I'll expel harm to generate two chi, I'll feline stomp to get the damage buff up, tiger palm, and then I'll fist a fury. That'll give me Zewin's battle gear, so the next sun kick will most likely crit. And then just go tiger palm, blackout kick, tiger palm, blackout kick. Reset the feline stomp, sun kick, tiger palm, blackout kick, sun kick reset there, so I can do a fist of fury to proc Zewin's battle gear again. Sun Kick, Blackout Kick, Tiger Palm, Blackout Kick, Reset, Feyline Stomp, Expel Harm for Extra Chi, Blackout Kick, Sun Kick, Tiger Palm, Blackout Kick, and then that's pretty much it. You Feyline Stomp if you can get resets, you Fist of Fury before Sun Kick whenever possible because you want it to crit, and then when it crits it reduces the cooldown on Fist of Fury. And then you're Blackout Kicking in between, paying attention to when your Sun Kick resets as it did there, and then Feyline Stomping when you can. Now one thing to keep in mind is that Feyline Stomp won't reset this much in actual PvP, because it's only going to reset when you're standing in it. So as a general rule for Feyline Stomp, you're going to be using it before you have meaningful damage. So if I Feyline Stomp, I can proc my Sky Reach, and then I Fist of Fury, which will do a lot of damage, and then that Sun Kick will most likely crit and get buffed up by the set bonus. I've got a Crane Kick proc here as well, which I can throw out, and then in between just Tiger Palm Blackout Kick, and use my Sun Kick resets. And that's pretty much it. And if in the event that you have absolutely nothing else to press, then you can just use Chi Wave or something. Now, I didn't mention a Strike of the Windlord because it's more of a burst ability. It's not something that you kind of just throw out in the middle of your rotation. You are trying to use it with your burst. If you were going to approach someone and just do your sustained rotation, but you want to open up with a little bit of damage, you'll do the exact same thing, except just open up with Strike of the Windlord. So run in, expel harm, you drop a Feyline Stomp, Tiger Palm, Struck the Windlord, then Fist of Fury. And then afterwards you can Tiger Palm into a Sun Kick, and then just continue on with the normal rotation. With Strike the Windlord, you kind of want to be using this during the Sky Reach windows if possible to get the most burst potential. And then because Strike of the Windlord gives you Thunder Fist, you also want that to crit because it hits pretty hard. If you're throwing out Strike of the Windlord randomly and not at good times and you lose potential, and I still make that mistake, I make bad calls, but that's generally what you should try and do with Strike of the Windlord. So, your Tiger Palm, Blackout Kick, Sun Kick, Fist of Fury, and Feyline Stomp with Dance of Chi-Gi procs on Spinning Crane Kick are your main toolkit, with Strike of the Windlord being the forefront of your burst and sort of the opener. 
when you hit a new target and you're applying Scourge to them. It's also usually the first button you press during your burst rotation, and that's what I'm going to cover now. So the burst rotation for Windwalker is pretty simple. It changes based on whether you're using Stormwith and Fire or Serenity. The main difference is Serenity makes all your cheese benders free and half the cooldown, whereas Stormwith and Fire you need to worry about how much cheese you have before starting the burst. Because the whole idea of bursting as a Windwalker is trying to fit as much damage as you can into your 6 second Skyreach window. So as an opener for a Windwalker, what you can do is make sure that you have your Feyline Stomp buff active on the target, then you'll Paralyze them, Leg Sweep, Tiger Palm, Serenity into Windlord, Fist of Fury for Zwen's Battle Gear, and your set bonus, and then finish with a Sun Kick. Afterwards, you can just go to Blackout Kick and Sun Kick, and then use Fist of Fury when it comes off cooldown, and then just keep on Sun Kicking, and that's pretty much all there is to it. The other burst option is Storm Earth and Fire, and the only difference is you need to monitor how much Chi you have when you go in. The good news is that you only need 5 Chi to do the burst. 6 Chi can make a difference, but it only makes a difference if you get lucky. Because you're going to need 2 Chi for the Strike of the Windlord, 3 for Fist of Fury, and 2 for Sun Kick. So that's 7 Chi in total. You can only have 6 Chi. Now, what that means is after the Fist of Fury, you're going to have to Tiger Palm to use the Rising Sun Kick, which is unfortunate, but it's what you have to do. Whereas if you have 6 Chi, you'll finish the Fist of Fury with one Chi remaining. If you get a proc of open palm strikes, then that will refund the one Chi that you can then use to Sun Kick immediately. But I generally don't even bother with that. So as an example for the rotation, you can walk in, expel harm for your two Chi, Feline Stomp the target, incap them, Leg Sweep, Tiger Palm, Storm and Fire into Windlord, then Fist of Fury, and then Tiger Palm into a Sun Kick. And then after that, you just go back to your standard Windwalker rotation. A good thing about Windwalker at the moment is you have ways of creating burst damage without using your cooldowns, or at least big cooldowns. Just Skyreach alone, with a Fist of Fury into a Sun Kick and even a Windlord, will do a lot of damage. You don't need Serenity, you don't need Zawin to do a lot of damage. Ways that you can create damage, you can also use Teachings of the Monastery. So, Let's say that you've got this kill target over here, and this target who you've been hitting for a little bit, and he's got Sky Reach on him. What you can do is you can target palm him a few times to get your teachings on the monastery up to two stacks, then swap over to your main target with a tiger palm, and then do fists into a sun kick, into a blackout kick, which will then shoot out four blackout kicks. And then if you get lucky, you'll reset the sun kick, and then you can expel harm into a sun kick. And that by itself should all fit into your Skyreach window and do very good damage. Now I haven't mentioned Zwen yet, that's because Zwen is kind of just a fire and forget thing. It does give you increased haste, and that will speed up your rotation, especially during Serenity. But the same rules apply, you know, you want to use Sun Kicks when you have Zwen's Battle Gear up for the extra crit buff, and also for your set bonus. You're channeling Fist of Fury, and then you're using Blackout Kicks when you don't have those available. Zwen will just increase the speed at which you do that, but ultimately nothing really changes. The way that I use Invoke Zwen personally, I'll either use it as my first burst and I won't use Serenity. So I'll do like a, I'll get my Chi and then I'll use Zwen and I'll Tiger Palm and I'll do Fist of Fury into Sun Kick. And then that alone should get, you know, a pretty decent chunk of their HP gone and maybe get some defensives out of the way. And then afterwards, you can use your Serenity Windlord potentially on another target. Or what you can do is open up with the original Serenity Windlord burst, get cooldowns out of people like that, and then use Zwen afterwards to keep the pressure rolling. Or you can use Zwen again on a different target. And a big part of Windwalker is swapping with your Skyreach windows and doing big damage to people, you know, with that extra crit buff that you're getting. And you want to utilize that as much as possible. And just to reiterate, Every time you hit a new target, you also get Alpha Tiger, which is the increased haste, which will increase the damage that you do to everyone because you're getting Sun Kicks back faster and Fist of Furies back faster. So that's the burst rotation, but now we can talk about strategy and just your general goal as a monk in the arena. So I'll start off with an example. Let's say that we're playing some twos. Skull is my kill target and Square is the off target. I'll start off with Feyline Stomp on the kill target for the damage buff. I'll paralyze the off target, and then I'll stun kill target, 
and then I'll do my burst. Now let's say that the healer has used some sort of defensive or even the kill target has trinketed and used something. I can then swap to the other target with my remaining duration on Serenity and continue doing damage. And by swapping and utilizing the remainder of your Serenity in another Skyreach window on a different target, you potentially get more defensives that way. Now in 3v3, it's pretty much the same thing, except you've got an additional target that you can swap to. And in a lot of games, you're going to find that there's going to be lots of pets and things just lying around. You know, warlocks are pretty popular, like demo warlocks, hunter pets, death knight pets, totems, what have you. So while you're just doing your thing and attacking, you'll see a pet somewhere, you tag it for alpha tiger, and then you keep on going. Then let's say you're ready to do another go, you end cap, fight a phalanx stomp, and then do some more damage. You can keep on hitting this target for a little bit, you can build up maybe teachings of the monastery, and then decide, okay, I'm going to do a, a cheeky swap to someone else, and then you pop Zwen, and you pop Skyridge on them, and then you can do some damage to this guy. Swap, maybe you get defensives, swap again, pop Phalanx Stomp on him, swap to a different target, Sun Kick, boost the Fury, keep that damage rolling, and just keep on swapping. The more people you hit, the more you utilize your damaging cooldowns during those Skyreach windows, the better you'll do. It's a lot more effective than just hammering into someone, especially during cooldowns. The only time that you should do that is if that target is in like severe danger and you could potentially kill them through defensives. But at the start of the game when no one's used any cooldowns and everything's still on the table, you may as well try and get the most value out of your cooldowns and your sky reaches. And by doing that, you potentially open up different opportunities for different people to die because maybe they just use a defensive. Because maybe that swap that you did to them forced a really big defensive out of them. Maybe you got some big crits. Maybe your partner swapped with you and also did some really good damage and forced a massive defensive. You know, a quick swap to a paladin with Skyreach and just Windlord and stuff can force bubble at the right time, especially if you cross CC beforehand. Now, outside of all the crowd control and the burst windows and stuff, you're going to have downtime because Skyreach has a minute cooldown. So outside of all that, you want to just try to be doing as much damage as possible and hitting the target that's the easiest for you to hit. And if possible, depending on what comp you're against, try to drag people on top of each other so that you can cleave them. It's like bringing a rogue onto a priest or something. The general idea of playing a monk is if you are their kill target, you want to make yourself really, really annoying to kill. And that can either be by running when you're in danger or by stacking yourself on other people so that they get cleaved. So it's either annoying for the DPS because they have to chase you or it's annoying for the healer because they have twice the amount to heal now because you're cleaving. But an important thing to do with Arena in general is the entire game isn't just you doing setups and scoring kills. You're going to spend a lot of time running. You're going to spend time peeling for your partner. You're going to spend time in crowd control and such getting peeled. But when you're playing defensive, don't overcommit to defense. Don't just continuously run and run and don't do anything offensively. You do want to try and keep pressure up as a monk. A stereotype about monk is that you do your burst and then literally leave the game for a whole minute and then only come back when Link sweeps up. That's not the case. You do stay in, you do commit to doing damage, but you run when you need to. If you're taking too much damage and your healer can't heal it, then you run. You go back in when you can. If you have some crowd control or something, or if your partner can crowd control, great. Go in, do some damage, get some pressure out, and make them play defensive. Because if they're playing defensive, then they're not doing as much damage to you because now they're under pressure. But if you're just playing scared, they're not going to be afraid of you and you're just going to get hammered. So Windwalkers need to strike a nice balance of doing setups, being offensive, but also knowing when to run. But I think that essentially covers everything I want to say about strategy. Ultimately, it all just comes down to practice. And the thing about Arena is everything's always changing. The comp that you play, the comp that you're playing against, mistakes that you make or mistakes that they make can completely change the way you approach the game. Sometimes you commit too many defensives. Sometimes you overlap defensives with your healer. Everything is changing. The important thing is to always be able to just adapt to the situation. And as a monk, trying to create openings for you to score kills by constantly swapping and exploit those weaknesses. And if you're seriously looking to improve on your own gameplay, the best thing I can recommend is to record your own clips and just watch them. Watch your setups, look to see if you've done crowd control, look to see if you could have done your burst better, see if you're overcommitting defensives, if you're not running at the right times, 
maybe you didn't run when your healer was in CC and had to use all of your defenses when you could have just transcended and you would have been fine. Sometimes you won't realize these things until you watch the games back. I will watch games that I record because I record for my YouTube videos and I'll watch them and I'll be like, I don't even recall making that mistake or thinking what I was doing was even wrong there, but you watch it and then you realize it and then you learn. But that whole section is finished now, so we can talk about some non-technical stuff and just go into some simple, easy stuff like stats. Now, stats for Windwalker are pretty simple. You're just going to go for versatility and mastery as much as possible. This means using the bloody coin gear, the Drake Breaker stuff, on the belt and the braces because versatility and mastery is not available on these pieces from the Conquest vendor. For your tier pieces, you're going to use gloves, pants, shoulders, and chest piece. And then you're also going to use the crafted boots and the helmet. I would recommend enchanting versatility and then using versatility mastery gems in anything that you can. And then also enchant speed on everything that you can as well. So on the boots, the braces, the chest piece, and the cape. If you want, you can use waking stats on the chest piece, which gives you more main stat and more damage at the cost of a little bit of speed, but I personally prefer the speed buff. For the weapons, I recommend you use Sophic Devotion. It gives you like over 900 agility. Stacked twice, that's 1800 agility, which on proc is going to give you a bigger damage increase than Serenity would. So keep track of your enchant procs because they will make your damage skyrocket. And with gear wrapped up, we can talk about some macros. The first macro worth mentioning is the disable macro. This just makes it so that you can cast disable on a target that's in a crowd control that would break on damage and it won't break it. So if this target is paralyzed and I press disable, it won't break it. I've got this mass cancel aura macro. This allows you to remove things that you might not want a mage to steal, like blessing of protection or blessing of freedom. Sometimes you want to remove slow fall. A really nice thing to have in here is cancel aura flying serpent kick. This allows you to flying serpent kick to a target and not break them out of a crowd control that would break upon damage. So if I paralyze and then I use serpent kick, can cancel it and it won't break the paralysis. It also cancels Storm Earth and Fire. If in the event that your clones get stuck in CC, you can press this button and it will just cancel them. I have a Focus Paralysis macro, nothing too special, as well as a Focus Kick macro. I have a Modifier Paralysis macro. This is bound to E on my bars. So if I press that binding without a modifier, it will cast it on Arena Target 1. If I press Control E, it's Arena 2. And if I press Alt E, it's Arena 3. I have a Leap macro. Zwen has an ability called Tiger Leap, and when you press this, he will use that ability to jump over to his current target. And it also has Pet Attack in there. I have this Tiger Palm macro, which also has Pet Attack in it, so whatever I am currently Tiger Palming, Zwen will be hitting as well. And it also has Cancel Aura Power Strikes in it. Now you might wonder why that's in there. It's a neat little trick. If you just cancel Aura Power Strikes, it will generate the cheat for you. Like that. I also have three macros for Storm Earth and Fire. One that casts Windlord immediately, one that casts Sunkick, and one that casts Vista Fury. Because occasionally you might want to open up your burst with a different ability. And what these macros do is make it so that your Stormworth and Fire never fails in the opener. If you just press Stormworth and Fire manually, and then you immediately use an ability, you will find that sometimes they won't cast it, or they'll fly off to a different enemy and hit something else, and you'll completely miss out on the damage. These macros ensure that that won't happen, so give them a try, just you know, find a different binding for them, and when you Tiger Palm and you're ready to do your burst, you just press this macro instead, and it will immediately cast the damaging ability and you won't have any issues. But you still want to have normal Storm Earth and Fire on your bars, because you want to use that to fixate your clones in the event that they are out of range of your kill target. I've got this macro, and basically what it does is, when you don't have a pet out, it shows the tooltip of Invoke Zwen, and when you do have a pet out, it will show the tooltip and cast Big Red Ray Gun, which is a toy that makes your pet big and red. So if I press it once, it will summon Zwen. If I press it again, it will give him the buff and make him look awesome. And I also get a lot of questions about what toys I use. These are the toys that I use in my burst macro. There are four toys that use fireworks, and then one toy that gives me the rainbow trail. I'll leave links in the description of where you can get all of these toys, and I'll leave the macro on the macro section as well. And with macros done, the last thing to talk about is race choice. So nowadays, Orc is no longer the outright best. This is because of the Trinket Set bonus that gives everyone 15% CC reduction. For Alliance, I would say that Human is still the best choice because if you want to, you can opt into running two DPS Trinkets and still have your Get Out of Stun ratio. 
even though it is a three minute cooldown, you can still have that as an option. Or you can just run your normal trinket setup and then you'll have a trinket for stuns every minute and a half instead of every two minutes because they share a 90 second cooldown. My personal favorite race for Alliance is Night Elf. This is because of Shadow Meld. Even if you're not a stealth class, Shadow Meld is still very powerful. It can be used to immune any CC reliably that has a travel time. So anything like Mortal Coil or Stormbolt, very easy to Shadow Meld. And even though it's a lot harder, you can meld pretty much anything in the game. You can Shadow Meld a Kidney Shot. You just have to do it exactly when it hits you. But there is a lot of skill involved with Shadow Meld and the potential for it is amazing. It has no global cooldown. It has no shared cooldown with your trinket either. And I mentioned earlier in the video that thing you can do where you summon Zawin, get the Alpha Tiger, and then teleport behind a pillar with Transcendence and then Shadow Melt to drop combat and then immediately res. Only Night Elves can really do that effectively because of the ability to drop combat straight away. And it's also good if you're playing with a mage and you want to eat food. You can teleport behind a pillar, Shadow Melt, and then eat food immediately because you've dropped combat. Dark Iron Dwarves are currently very popular as well. Their ratio allows them to cleanse themselves of practically every debuff. It can remove bleeds, it removes curses, it removes a lot of stuff. And currently, assassination rogues are very prevalent. So playing a Dark Iron Dwarf and being able to cleanse yourself of all bleeds, especially during like a death mark burst, is very strong. And for everything that you cleanse off of yourself, you gain a primary stat boost, which can buff your burst and sustain damage for a little bit. And for Horde, the most prevalent racials are Orc, obviously, because of Blood Fury for the extra damage and the stun reduction, and Blood Elf for the Purge. And the Purge is very helpful against things like Paladins, being able to remove Bop, being able to remove things like Power Infusion is very handy as well, but it has varying levels of usefulness based on what you're fighting. But I'm just going to go ahead and give you the best advice and say, play whatever race you want. You're going to have more fun and be more inclined to play if you're playing a character that you care about. Or at least that's how it is for me. I mainly play Night Elf because I love the way they look, but Shadow Meld is also my favorite racial. So my suggestion is to play whatever you like, but if you really want to play the best, it's either Human or Dark Iron Dwarf for Alliance, and Orc for Horde with Blood Elf coming in second. And with that, the guide is finished. Thank you for watching. Hopefully it's been helpful. If there's anything I missed or if you have any questions about anything I talked about or anything I didn't talk about, please feel free to leave a comment. I will answer every comment, I promise. Once again, thank you for watching. More videos on the way soon. And yeah, I'll catch you guys later. Take care.